yo, yo, y'all can't stand right here. In his right hand was the man's worst nightmare. So hi, I'm Ali. Thank you so much for joining the DSP Remix, where we are going to talk about ways to remaster your DSP with the most advanced capabilities. Um, <laughs> someone already chatted, all caps, RIP Doom. Uh, that was MF Doom we were playing earlier. Um, okay, so let's get started. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, so presenting today, we have our world-class talent at Chalice, I'm gonna give everyone's creds as we go through the presentation. Um, but I'll just start, I'm Ali, I'm COO at Chalice, your host today. I um, led uh, go to market and sales ops at Google and then Snapchat. I lead sales at Chalice, so I might drop a line or two about how Chalice makes these capabilities seamless, easy, turnkey for you. Um, but we're really focused today on content that can teach anyone how to use, um, use these capabilities. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Adam Heimlich. He is our CEO. Adam Street Cred goes back to a 20-year rewind where he started um, optimizing search campaigns in Google AdWords in 2002. Um, so he has been in perform digital performance media since the earliest days. He moved into programmatic um, and founded Horizon Media's trading desk and then left um, or really started Chalice because he was interested um, in using these advanced capabilities in the DSP, knew he needed um, top-notch data scientists and engineers to make that happen. So Adam, I'm going to let you press play. Thanks, Ali. All right, so this is going to be a two-minute intro. Uh, to tell you, uh, help orient you in the world of, of custom algorithms, advanced DSP capabilities. So as Ali said, I'm someone who's been in performance a long time. Um, I always wanted to use the most advanced capabilities in DSP, uh, and we created Chalice as a tool to make that easier. So we're going to do a couple of slides on why that's desirable. So first, like we're showing in the little diagram there, uh, something like the Chalice technology or this kind of work, even if you do it manually, gives you a bigger optimization loop, right? Usually you're optimizing just between the DSP and the exchanges. Uh, this lets you encompass your strategic planning into the optimization and have custom goals, custom values, even custom costs, according to what the brand is trying to do. Next slide will show a very simple version of, of, of what it looks like compared to the status quo, right? So a lot of people use AI and advanced techniques to output the best audience for a campaign. And we at Chalice would look at audience as a binary signal, right? That's how the DSP sees it. All it knows is, is someone in the audience or out of the audience. If they're out, I'm gonna pay whatever the data fee is. I mean, if they're in, I'm gonna pay whatever the data fee is. If not, I'm gonna pass on them. Um, when you do uh, a custom algorithm, and especially when we get to user scoring, we'll cover this in detail, you have the ability to look at the target audience with a lot more granularity, right? So the trade desk would say that you express much more of the brand's values when you look out at your target audience, and some might be worth one and some might be worth a thousand, and everything in between gets expressed in your audience. So what, the way Google talks about this shift is the, is the move from precision to prediction, right? That's really what advanced capabilities are about. Instead of having a very precise audience, you're predicting the value and the cost of, of every, everyone you reach. So to use these advanced capabilities, there, there's really three things that, that are necessary. You need, you need someone who's skilled in advanced statistical methods to be able to do predict, prediction. That all falls today under the banner of data science. Uh, you need some engineering, right? These are back-end capabilities of the, of the DSP. So if you think of the way you usually operate a DSP as the user interface, the back-end interface is called the API, the application interface. Uh, and you're going to want to automate a lot of these tasks because they have to be done over and over when you're doing an algorithm. And, and third and most important is the fuel. The fuel for prediction is, is data. Um, so you, you want the most granular data possible on your impressions, your conversions, your monitoring, your measurement, what have you. 
whatever it is, a lot of data. So Chalice kind of packages these things up and makes, makes it easy to get to market and the capabilities we're about to talk about. Back to Ali. Thanks, Adam. All right, I am going to pass the mic to Rob Mooney to talk about custom bidding. Just to intro you to Rob, he has spent over a decade remixing programmatic um, at Publicis. He started at the trading desk at Spark, um, and then most recently was a thought leader at Publicis about the best practices for programmatic before he joined Chalice. Um, last week, you told a client that the reason he joined Chalice is he wanted to do um, any crazy thing he could think up of doing. Um, too hard to get it done where he was and really excited to be here um, to make this stuff happen. Great, thanks, Ali. Uh, excited to be talking with you all today about uh, custom bidding and, and uh, DB360. So custom bidding is uh, Google's take on the bring your own algorithm. It's a bit different than uh, most of the other DSPs in this space. Um, in that instead of uploading a, uh, a distinct set of bid instructions with the you know, exact inventory and pricing that you'd like to pay, you're actually uploading in a script um, that's giving um, weights to different features that are important to you. And those features could be either uh, website-based, based on floodlight tags, or um, based on the bid stream. So different things like site and SSP, et cetera. And so, um, you know, it's a little less, um, so you get a little less detail um, because what you're essentially doing is instead of ripping out the, the brain of the algorithm from uh, the DSP, you're, you're basically pointing Google's neural network in the direction that you want and helping it value things that are important to you. Um, instead of the one to everything is weighted as one, which is like the historical approach for their automated bidding that any, anything you said as a conversion, no matter, uh, they're all equivalent. And so that this allows you um, just, to add some differentiation between that. So the simplest uh, kind of use case you would use custom bidding is the floodlight weighting. And so a lot of times this is gonna be for a, a conversion event that doesn't happen often. Um, so what you wanna do is since these algorithms are, are require so much data to, to, to train and learn, um, you know, if the a conversion event doesn't happen too often, um, the algorithm is going to struggle. So a way to beef up the data is to uh, add a, you know, a site event that happens more often. We'll say a homepage or an add to cart. Um, but we don't want to um, equal all of those conversion events the same. Um, we want that homepage visit to be maybe scored at a one, the add to cart at a five, and the, the actual sales conversion as a 10. And so that simple type of weighting you can do in Google today without any scripting Python skills. They have a goal builder. Um, it's not something we use, but in, you know, if you want to take a simple foray into custom bidding, um, you're able to use the goal builder to do some simple fun light weighting. And it's, and it's very effective, you know, at, even, at, even with just you know, two or three additional floodlights. Um, the other basic kind of use case that we think about is using the U variables that, are, that come in on the floodlights. And U variables are dynamic parameters that basically are being passed from your website um, into the floodlight. And, and those values are you know, usually from your data layer. It's whatever um, a, you know, the website developer has set the tag uh, up to receive. And things could be variables could be like um, from a product detail page, what brand is that product? If it, what vertical? Uh, it could be a lifetime value score given after a sign up. It could be um, a flag that denotes that it was a first time deposit. Um, so all the things that you pass the floodlight tag, you can actually use um, in a custom bidding script. And so an area where uh, you know, we, we saw great success with this is we had an e-commerce client who had something like 5,000 brands on their site. They only wanted to drive net new conversions. And so um, we did the analysis to understand that there are certain brands that are uh, you know, more likely to be purchased on, on that very first purchase. And so we were able to create a, a custom script that scored all the different brands um, uh, based on their propensity to drive a first purchase. And so that algorithm was much more effective at driving so said purchases. Um, the other thing, uh, so conversion counting, that's very basic just in terms of, uh, you know, click-based 
conversions versus view through conversions. You can denote what, if, if that one of those things is more important than the other. And then with Google Analytics, this would be GA4, or I guess the, the free premium version of Google Analytics. If you don't have a really scaled out you know, floodlight um, setup, you could potentially use your, your Google Analytics uh, conversions um, in, in a custom script. Go to the next slide, Ali. So where it gets more exciting with custom bidding is, is the advanced use cases. So when we talked about the floodlights in the beginning, um, in, in the earlier slide, we talked about maybe one, two, or three, and, and it was really, you know, big whole numbers. And we just, we know the sale is more important. So we gave it a 10 and the add to carts more, less important, the more important the homepage. So we gave these arbitrary large round numbers. It all makes sense to us why we gave them. But when we start looking at, you know, 50 floodlights or a hundred floodlights and looking at how, um, you know, from 50 different floodlights, what is the propensity of a person when they hit one floodlight to, to ultimately hit your final conversion? How do you start weighting that? And, you know, the average trader is going to have a hard time coming up with weights for 50, odd, you know, some odd um, uh, floodlights when some of them can be like, you hit the about us page or, you know, the investor page or right? these random pages that might not like, might, may not seem like they have any pr predictive qualities, but after a data scientist has done the modeling, they, they may in fact, and so how do you score that? You're gonna need somebody with, with statistics and machine, machine learning background to, to come up with those types of scores. Um, and then to combine on top of that, we wanna start looking at the, the bitstream data. So all the different things that come through in the Google data transfer file um, from site, SSP, zip code, region, you know, there, there's 50 some odd you know, columns, finding out which of those features are also predictive at driving, you know, conversions or whatever else you're trying to do. And then tying that all back together with the floodlights. So, you, you know, if you're starting to see that you have 50 floodlights and then you're finding that there's 10,000 sites that have predictive qualities, SSPs, you know, now, now we're talking about, you know, tens of thousands, if not, you know, millions of characters. Um, and so to do that type of uh, Python script, you know, you're uploading that through the API, but, um, you know, we're, that's where we've really seen the great success is when you move on from just these basic use cases and, you, and you're really starting to take into account everything that's available in the bitstream and then all of the floodlight and new variable data that you have on your site. Um, and the last thing for custom bidding and advanced use cases is, is GA360. So this is the paid version of, of Google Analytics, but what you can do here is some really fancy stuff with the goals that you've set up. So um, if you have a goal on your, your site for uh, a user's visited seven uh, different pages or has spent five minutes on this site, um, you can actually use those as things the algorithm will optimize towards. So you can find more impressions that drive um, those types of on-site conversions. So um, yeah, it's really powerful, um, all of these. Um, and so, uh, yeah, let's see what's next. Okay. And so custom bidding is can be pretty tricky early on in Google because you have to really, uh, one, take a step back and remember that you're not user scoring, um, your impression scoring and your algorithm is um, assigning value to every impression that it scores. So when you measure a custom bidding algorithm, you're not really measuring the CPA that it produces or what or the viewability or the attention, you know, a time on screen that it's, it's producing. You want to maximize the scoring of the algorithm. So that's where this value cost ratio comes into play. Um, you're trying to maximize your value cost, which may ultimately drive down a CPA or increase a completion rate or whatever it might be, but you just really need to be able to take a step back and understand you're, you're not looking at your traditional KPIs when you're measuring these things. They're related, but that's not how you're um, ultimately measuring if an algorithm is successful or not. And then lastly, the AP testing functionality in Google is really important to use um, when, when testing different custom bidding scripts, especially for us. We don't like to use a lot of audiences. We, we prefer to run on the open exchanges. Um, and giving the algorithm the full uh, every bidding opportunity that it can take advantage of. 
Um, but if you don't have an A-B testing um, a feature to, to have mutually exclusive audiences, these two scripts can end up cannibalizing themselves. And so um, you have ultimately, they bit each other off and, and you don't get a true um, understanding of performance between the two. So it's really important to be using that A-B testing um, capability when, when running custom bidding scripts and DB360. And then right here, we have a case study for our, um, an incremental sales lift. So this is a, a DTC fitness brand. Um, and so uh, basically they wanted, we looked at um, all the different um, site floodlight activities. So the 50 odd floodlight activities and then all of the different bid string features available and put together um, a custom script that was able to drive 68% uh, incremental sales and lift over a PSA and um, a 19% reduction in the cost per incremental sale compared against the Google, Google DEV 360 platform algorithm. So I will hand it back to you, Allie. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate you taking us through custom bidding. Um, that is Google's uh, solution. We are now going to switch it over to Trade Desk. And who we have here to talk to you about that is an OG trade desker, Mark Leonard. He was employee number 28 at the trade desk, built New York and EMEA's trading teams there, um, and has also done some interesting agency work since. He worked at Hawkfish on Bloomberg's presidential campaign. If you think you've ever had pacing and budget delivery issues, <laughs> you have not had them like Mark has. Um, anyway, he's, he's the perfect person to talk about the trade desk's most advanced capability multi-dimensional bidding. Great. Thank you, Alan, for that lovely introduction. Although I'm not sure I've had that many cases of issue, but uh, no, I've got the pleasure today to talk to you all about multi-dimensional bidding within CTD in particular, which is a very powerful tool in my opinion. Um, a quick summary or high level overview of what it actually does. It's predicting the combinations of bids uh, and together, together collectively um, to submit one bid versus individual bids. So by that, I mean looking, looking at individual vectors and just changing the adjustments on site or something like that. We're going to get into some more exciting examples in just a few slides here. But in terms of keying off of the combinations, and you might be asking how we actually get to that, there's a few different ways that we fuel our multi-dimensional bid lists in particular. And one of the most important ones or most, most popular we use is red or log level file. So that's raw event data. And we can take that, ingest that into our chalice model um, and predict these combinations and provide two insights into what those combinations will look like actually even before we go live. But that's just one data source, right? And we're going to talk about a few more outside of what's even listed here, but just to round it out. You'll see conversion data, monitoring data, and targeting data are all also part of ways that we can actually create these multi-dimensional combinations. And then the last piece that is a big call out is this is a continuous loop once we create our multi-dimensional bid list um, based on your KPI. So whatever that KPI might be, we're continuously updating our models, um, whether that's every other day or once a week, but it's a, a continuous loop. And so let's let's break it down a little bit more um, and look at combinational bidding or multi-dimensional bidding, I should say, in comparison to just bid modifiers. So you'll see here two, two examples on the screen. The left one is just basic bid modifiers, you know, base bid starting 10. You might pull a report, see that CNN is performing well, and you want to bid up on it. So that'd be an individual optimization of 1.1x. And then perhaps you look at your geo report, see New York City's doing well, so you're now up to 1.2. And then perhaps SSP, triple lift, uh, you're doing a 1.5. So collectively, those three individual bid adjustments come to a bit, a final bid, a final submitted bid of 20. Um, so again, it's a lot of individual adjustments along the way. On the right side, though, the exciting part is the multi-dimensional bid list in the example here. And so it's similar to the one on the left. But the biggest difference you're going to see here is that there, it's a combination of platter, meaning it's looking at CNN, New York City, and triple lift. And those three variables collectively, we're going to do a 1.4x bid adjustment. 
So that comes in $14. So $6 savings right there, but uh, incredibly powerful in terms of just simplicity of managing the campaign as well as helping performance. And then let's go down just another green. Um, two slides ago, I mentioned some of the data sources that we've utilized to ingest into our chalice model and system um, in order to produce these multi-dimensional bid lists. But you might be asking yourself, okay, well, once you've done that, how does that actually get into my campaign or ad groups within TPD? And so what we do with Chalice here is we actually utilize the API and we'll take that data or those models and push them via the API straight into the specific ad groups. Um, but here you also see a visual of six different combinations. So kind of expanding on the example from the last slide, but you'll see six different zip codes, six different days of week, time of day, uh, six different sites. But then even more so important is the six different bids there. So they're all varying based on those combinations and the score that we ultimately give them. Now, this is again, a simple, simple example, and I can't emphasize that enough, but uh, if you blow this out to your full campaign, you know we could be talking about lines up into the millions. And let's not forget about other variables or vectors such as browser, ad format, device. And so this can just compound and just get larger and larger again based on the data that we're ingesting for you. But very powerful at the end of the day. And then one big thing that Charles we're really proud about that we've been doing a lot lately is our brain lift um, algos via multi-dimensional data. And so again, I mentioned log level files, reds, conversion data, those all help fuel the model, but we're actually open the door to looking at brand lift data and bringing that in, running our model, and then creating our multi-dimensional bid list off of that to push in and steer campaigns while they're actually live. And so you'll see the chalice bar in the, in the diagram there, and this is by the way for a luxury automotive brand who was trying to promote a brand new vehicle that they're pushing out in its market. And so obviously for them, they want to get as much brand lift as possible and then increase ultimately sales. So you have on the bottom business as, as usual in the diagram there. So that would be if you were to set up a campaign, you know, you want to see brand lift, but you set it up and you let it run, collect the data. And then at the end of the campaign, you see actually the lift. Um, where Chalice is different and where our percentage is actually quite higher in comparison to the two for business as usual, is the fact that we were getting real-time updates and data from our brand lift um, provider and partner. And so we were, again, looking at log level or raw data itself, figuring out what pockets we needed to help push and increase lift overall, which is why you'll see such a huge spike. Um, again, this is very technical in, in terms of what Chalice is doing on the back end and the modeling. So this would be a little bit different than perhaps a normal red spinal. But again, I wanted to really just drive home the point that we're able to ingest data from a lot of different sources. We're not limited to just the DSP data. And so it's very exciting for us to be able to take all these different data sources, smash them all together, and then put together these very powerful combinational multi-dimensional data lists. So with that said, I'm gonna hand it back over to you, Alan. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mark. Um, we wanted to mention that this capability is very similar in Beeswax, um, a DSP we also like to use for special um, campaigns. It's called Bid Models in Beeswax. Um, it works very similarly. The big difference is that Beeswax lets you have an unlimited amount of rows in your multidimensional bid list, um, whereas Trade Desk limits you to a few thousand or a few million rows, excuse me. Um, all right, I am now going to turn it over to Kevin Voigt, who is our grand master, um, coming also from a long stint at Publicis, um, doing programmatic activation. So Kevin is going to talk to us about another trade desk feature called volume control. Thanks, Allie. Let's pump up the volume. All right. Volume control or VC is another powerful trade desk API tool that balances pacing and performance. So what happens is the trade desk is going to prioritize spend toward a specific vector if that vector appears in the bid request. So like the waterfall picture of the chalice glasses, 
we're pouring spend in the top performing chalice and then spend trickles down to the lower priority chalices. What we want to emphasize here is VC surgically buys high value inventory. For example, let's say an ad group is seeing great performance from a particular impression placement ID on a site. And to be clear, the impression placement ID is a unique ad slot on a publisher's site. Anytime that specific impression placement ID on that site comes into a bid request, the ad group is going to bid immediately. This is extremely effective. You can really start to see scale and performance when you couple multimetral bidding with VC. Next slide. All right. So this case study is for a, uh, a wellness brand uh, CPA goal. It showcases the power of using both multidimensional bidding and volume control. In the early weeks, we started using, utilizing multidimensional bidding. And once we collected more data over time, we started to see which particular vectors really drove performance. VC and those particular vectors forced spend against them, which drove down CPA further. In the end, we were able to decrease CPA by 70%. And 20% lower than Trade Desk Coa out those algorithm. All right, back to you, Allie. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate it. Um, just another uh, note on beeswax. This is what beeswax calls delivery models. Um, so once again, something that works uh, pretty similarly in the Trade Desk and beeswax. All right, so next, I am going to pass the mic to Tai Lin who is remastering data science um, through her work um, with, with her PhD um, studies. She is combining the latest and greatest algorithms to tackle some of advertising's most uh, complex challenges. And she is going to talk to us about user scoring, which is certainly the most advanced data science application that you could bring into, uh, we think, any DSP. Hey everyone, thanks for the intro, Ali. Excited to talk about this. This is one of our latest API integrations and use cases. So on the data science and engineering side, we're super excited about this. So as Adam mentioned earlier, typically you'll see something like an audience in the DSP. You can include and exclude, but you can't dr drill down further than that. What we love about user scoring is that you can take an audience of hundreds of millions of people and assign a unique base price per user based on the output of your advanced machine learning algorithm. So not only can we decide who we want to target, we can decide exactly how much we should be paying for each of these users based on a wide variety of data that we have. This gives us precise control over pricing, but the other great part is that this doesn't take up any bid space. Trade Desk has a hard cap of 500 million bid lines per advertiser. So when you layer on what Mark was talking about with the multidimensional bid rows, what Kevin likes to do with the volume control, and then anything else, you can quickly hit that cap with all of the dimensions that we like to be able to control for. A good workaround is user scores. We can easily score hundreds of millions of users directly through the API without taking up any of that space. And finally, this can be used in conjunction with the multidimensional bidding and the volume control. We can think of it as a base bid per user, essentially. So if we have a multidimensional model that tells us sites, supply vendors, and ad formats to target, we can layer on these user score base bids. So we're still working together with our models and still using volume control to pick apart the ones that we want to purchase first and how they can play together with the model. We've actually recently started using this with one of our clients and I'll show you how we use this in a case study. So a particular use case for user scoring that we found is lifetime value. It's a great buzzword. We all want to know exactly how relevant these customers are going to be, how much money these customers are going to spend, and a good metric for determining exactly how important these customers are and what we should pay is lifetime value. So we have the interesting use case of predicting lifetime value per user and laying that into a multidimensional bid model. And what we found is that our advanced machine learning algorithms were accurate. We found great machine learning metrics and we were able to upload tens of millions of user scores that played so nicely in conjunction with our model that we found an increase of lifetime value per dollar of 2.9 times the, the case study, or sorry, the baseline in display, 2.1 times the base in native, 
and 2.2 times the base in video. We've seen that these metrics continue to improve as our models get more data, and we're able to upload more user scores consistently with finer and finer precision. Thank you, Tylan, for taking us through user scoring. Um, we are now at the Q&A part of the um, webinar. We also realize we are just a couple minutes over the half hour. If you need to drop, like I said before, this is being recorded. We're going to drop it on social, YouTube, and also follow up with the link. Um, but we are here to answer any questions you have. You can drop those in the Q&A button on Zoom. And I am just going to read off the um, first question we have in our Q&A, which is, do you see limits in your approach as cookies become less able to provide user level information on conversions? And I'm going to throw that question to Adam um, because it is one of his favorite topics. Dad, can you, can you read it one more time? Sure. Do you see limits in your approach as cookies become less able to provide user level information on conversions? Yeah, so in, in a word, no, like we're just, we're, we're built for the transition away from user-based prediction. And easy, kind of easy way to think about it is that user-based prediction was the standard for algorithms, right? In platforms for, for a long time because it was available and easy, but it was never the best way. Um, it was always better to take all the data that's available, right? Because the more data, the more prediction. It was just hard. So we think of cookie deprecation as 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 really the removal of one field uh, that still leaves us, you know, forty some odd fields that are useful for prediction. So I'll say a couple other things. First, like to move from ID based to all signals based is is just objectively better, right? There's there's only there's only one user ID per browser. So millions in the, in the U.S., but there's billions of combinations of site, hour, and zip code to take one example, right? So billions versus millions is always better. It's just that there didn't used to be tools to help you use that much data, and, and now there are. Um, so we really skipped over, like aggregating sites by content categories or categorizing the type of page content. Like we actually predict on the URL, the domain URL, or even the subdomain URL if it's available. Um, it's just because technology has become more advanced and we're a very new tool. Um, the other thing is that, that some sort of ID is needed to count frequency and to join impressions and conversions. So we're not, in, we're not directly involved in that area of the industry, but we're satisfied that the solutions that are coming on board to, uh, to do those joins and frequency counting uh, will be good, will be viable, at least for big clients by the end of this year. Thanks, Adam. I knew you would like answering that question and we did not plant it. All right, next up is would search data and conversions from log and Google Analytics data be a signal, key signal in driving the algorithm? Rob, I think. Yeah, I'm, uh, can you repeat that one more time? I yep. heard the first half. Yeah, sure. Would search data and conversions from log and Google Analytics data be a key signal in driving the algorithm? Yeah, as long as the, the way that it works is, you know, any, any conversion event that you have in Google Analytics that's important to you can be used to, to inform the algorithm and, and how you want to weight it. So if there are certain um, Google Analytics events that are extremely important, um, you can weight those the highest. Uh, the highest value um, of yeah, that doesn't you're include search data, but it will include landings from search. Like Google Analytics won't have the number of people who search something, and they won't really have the clicks, but they'll have the landings and the search words, well, right? Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it has to be on 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 the site, not the actual uh, in, in the Google search terms. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for uh, answering that, Rob, and clarifying, Adam. All right, I got another one on Google Custom Bidding. Um, so on Google Custom Bidding, you mentioned cost per value as a way of measuring the algorithm's performance. Is this because you're comparing multiple algorithms, aka neural networks, at the same time? Yes. Yeah, so 
the way that you so the way that the Google algorithms it scores every impression that it can, and so you have it at, at, after it scored all of the impressions, you have an you have a summation of total total value that's been assigned. Um, but it costs you something to get all of that value. So when you divide your total scores of all the impressions by what it costs you to get to, that's your that's your value cost. And a custom bidding script, like I mentioned, it's not optimized into that media KPI that you're used to. Its goal is to maximize impression value. So it's trying to get you the highest uh, score for all of the impressions that it purchased. And so that is why you, you need to measure these custom algorithms off of a value cost ratio because it's not maximizing, it's it's not optimizing to your media KPI. It's trying to optimize to the highest score that it can generate. Let me know, let me know if I need to clarify that. Thanks, Rob. Um, as a follow-up to that, you had mentioned that you um when you're optimizing the cost of value, you're not optimizing to um, viewability or other metrics like that. But are those metrics you can build into the algorithm's logic? Certainly, yes. Yeah. So um, you can include uh, in view. You can include um, time. Uh, what is it? Time Duration. on stream, audible at complete. Um, so all of those active view metrics can be incorporated into a, a custom bidding script um, and to account for them. Yeah. Great. Thank you. All right. One more question I have um, so far um, is on trade desk multidimensional bidding. The question is, how much do uh, does multidimensional bidding really impact uh, performance versus a smart bid modifying strategy? You take it, Allie. I'll take that one. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it's a sales question. Sure. Um, so yeah. So what we found is that multi-dimensional bidding, that precision really matters for performance. Um, we've run our own models. I'm not going to misquote um, Ken, who's told me the number before. I can put it into um, the video link once we have it. Um, but we've seen like dramatic performance improvement when you use multidimensional bidding versus a bid modifier. The, the example of a $20 bid versus a $14 bid um, is like a real life example that we see. Great. All right, the last question I'm going to ask myself is if I'm really interested in this stuff, but I don't have access to amazing data science and engineering, where should I go? Does anyone have a guess? You can come to Chalice. <laughs> um, so we live and breathe this stuff every day. We have an amazing data science and engineering team who spent um, several years and at least a million dollars in research and development to build these products so that they're turnkey um, for you. Um, oh, we have one more Q&A question. So I'm not going to wrap there just yet. Um, it's a great question. Did Chalice build the LTV for the client that we used um, as the example, or did the client bring their own LTV scores? So I can also answer that question. Um, so the client has their own lifetime value scoring methodology they use. It's really precise. Um, and that actually gets pulled into their Trade Desk Reds data. And then we activate on that. It comes to us daily for all the conversions um, or from quotes from the day before. Um, and so that's amazing because we can act you know, directly on their LTV data. Um, that said, if you didn't have an LTV model, um, we could, with the right data, um, model something for you. Something that Adam likes to talk about is even if you don't have like a really um, complicated LTV model, perhaps you just have three scores, like great, good, and fair in terms mm -hmm. of prospect that is drives a lot more um, power LTV wise than having no scoring at all. So a really simple model could give you a lot of predictive power or at least a good start for predictive power. All right, any other questions? This is last call. All right, we really appreciate your time. Thanks to those who could stay um, a bit late on the call to do all this awesome Q&A. Um, we really appreciate uh, all of our partners and um, 
clients here today and prospective clients. So with that, we will drop the mic and see you on social. Thanks, everyone.